Please rise. We, re we respond responsively. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let us confess our sins. Lord Jesus Christ, you came into this world which was filled with our sin. We decorate, we put up trees, we prepare for Christmas. But far too often we do all these preparations without putting you into Christmas. Lord, for our distractions, for our forgetfulness, for our sins against you and our neighbors, forgive us. For us a child was born, for us a son was given, his name is Jesus. The government was on his shoulders, they placed a cross on his shoulders. They may have put it there, but he did it for us. He took our sins upon himself and he died for them. He is indeed wonderful, mighty, everlasting, and the bringer of peace. We sing in praise to God. seated. We read together responsively according to the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David. He went there to register with Mary. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. This is the gospel of our Lord. We now sing together hymn 56.
Dear Christian friends, the lesson for our focus is from Genesis chapter 21, beginning with the first verse. We read, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. This is the word of our Lord. Today we take a look back about 4,000 years to the very time of Abraham and to the time of his wife, Sarah. God chose these two people for his own special purposes, the purpose of being father and mother of many nations. It was through this selected couple that he would not only bring a bunch of people, but particularly he would bring the promise of the Savior one step closer to its fulfillment. Now Abraham and Sarah had been married, and and while they were already fairly old, Abraham was 75 when he first heard the promise that God made to him, saying that he would make him into a father of many nations, that he would make him into a nation that was as numerous as all the stars in the sky or as the grains of sand on the seashore. And again, this to a guy who was 75. God's promise took a while before it was finally fulfilled, at least from a human perspective. Abraham and Sarah had to wait. Now almost 25 years had gone by and Abraham was about to round out a hundred. Finally, God came to them again and, and he repeated the promise and gave some clarification on when this child would come. He said, I'm going to come back and see you again in a year. And when I do, Sarah will have a son. You see, Sarah had gone on for quite a while and she hadn't had any children her entire life. She had been waiting and waiting and and praying and wishing. Who knows how many stars she might have tried to wish upon or how many four-leaf clovers she might have tried to pick. Year after year had gone by and she was still left a bit empty, a bit disappointed. And even when she finally heard this promise from God's own mouth, even as she heard this promise, she didn't take it to heart. In fact, she laughed at the thought. What a ridiculous thing, she thought. What what an impossible thing. What an absurd notion that I should have a child in my old age like this. Completely absurd, she thought. And yet, is anything too wonderful for God? Not at all. Is there anything so great that God can't do it? Not at all. And that's what we mean when we say that God does miracles. We mean to say that He can do anything, even disrupt the natural progression of things, even disrupt the laws of nature if He chooses to accomplish what He wants. And so the Lord attended to Sarah. That is to say that he visited her with a saving purpose. God did for Sarah something like what a nurse or a doctor might do for a patient. And what I mean is the nurse and the doctors, they don't just come into the the hospital room and and look at the charts or, or look at what's written on the wall and then say, wow, you've got problems. Good luck with that. 
and walk out. No, instead, they do everything they can. They look at those charts. They look at what's written on the wall. They, they pour over those notes. They look at the tests. They administer the IVs. They check those x-rays and other scans, and they come up with the best plan they have for relief and help and, Lord willing, a full restoration to health. They spring into action. They do something. And that's what God did for Sarah. In fact, something even greater. Because our God, unlike the doctors and the nurses, is not limited or bound in any way, not by his knowledge or his expertise or his wisdom or the science of the day. Our God's limits know no bounds, and neither does his love. And so he was able to produce this child for Sarah in the exact time that he had intended. Within a year's time, this child was delivered. And what a change a year can make. It's interesting that Sarah named this child Isaac, which means laughter. It's interesting because in this chapter, it sounds like she named him Isaac because she was so overjoyed that she finally had this child. But we can flip back just a few paragraphs in Genesis and see that when God initially had, had come to her a year before, and he promised this child, she laughed because she didn't believe it. It sounded ridiculous. It's interesting then that she would name him Isaac. Perhaps that name Isaac would be a permanent reminder of her own doubt when she heard this promise. But not only of her doubt and her misgivings of God's promises, it was also a certain reminder of the joy that this child now did bring her. Yes, as she says here, she would name him Isaac, and, and all who would hear about this would laugh along with her. She would share the joy of this child. She would share the joy of being able to listen to him cry, listen to him babble, to feel him wrap his little fist around her tiny finger. She would get to hold him and to nurse him, a joy that she had been looking for now for a lifetime. All that waiting, all that hope and expectation, and now finally it was here, this child called laughter. Yes, Sarah explained, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age? You know, we might treat a lot of God's promises in much the same way. When we examine what God promises to us, is it something that we would expect? Is it something that we would naturally come to expect on our own? particularly when it comes to the prophecies concerning our Savior and how he came the first time. Is that something any of us would have guessed? Would any of us have come up with the idea that God wouldn't demand sacrifices and offerings and pilgrimages, but rather that he would send his Son to die in our place? Who would have dreamed that the very Son of God, God himself, would take on human flesh and live among his own creation. Who could have thought up that this King of kings, this Lord above all lords, would be laid gently and humbly in a manger rather than being laid on a soft bed in some palace somewhere? Who could have supposed that out of all the people on the planet that God could have sent his angels to that night, he sent them not to the kings, not to the emperors, not even to the religious leaders of his day, but he sent those angels rather instead to a few shepherds out in the fields nearby that little town of Bethlehem. Who could have guessed or supposed any of this? 
And so we had reason to doubt, in a sense, because of our own skepticism, because of our own personal doubts. But we shouldn't doubt God, and we shouldn't doubt His promises. Because our God has a perfect track record. He never once has broken a promise. He never once has forgotten a promise. And as we see his perfect track record, which includes his promises to Sarah and Abraham, we see the perfect track record that eventually led to Jesus coming into this world our one and only Savior. We see the track record that we can count on for our own lives. And so especially in those times when we have our own doubts and our own misgivings, when our sins pile up so high and we feel the weight of that guilt, when we feel the weight of what our sins truly deserve, which is that God should turn away from us, abandon us, and take everything good away from us. When we begin to feel that condemnation of what we really deserve, it's right then that we need to go back to those promises. It's right then that our doubts and our fears are answered in the name of that child who was born there in Bethlehem. It's right there we can remember this promise that God made and fulfilled to Sarah and Abraham even as he brought that child Isaac into the world. And again, that child was one more generation closer, one more step closer to bringing our Savior into this world. And so I want you to see the strong connection between God's faithfulness to Abraham and Sarah as he brought Isaac into this world and the connection that he was also being faithful to his promises even to Adam and Eve when he promised them from the very beginning that he would send a Savior to settle our debt of sin. Generation after generation went by and God still remained faithful. Finally, as things got closer, he finally made even more promises to Mary and to Joseph and fulfilled them as well. So what a great time we have to celebrate as we gather around God's Word again. What an awesome season we're in as we pour over these promises of God, these promises now fulfilled. So what surprises you the most about God's plans? Is it all the fine details of these things that we wouldn't have guessed to begin with? Or is it the simple truth that God forgives you. Yes, you. Even in those times when you have trouble forgiving yourself, even in those times where you say, you know, I've, I've been here before. I've already asked for forgiveness for this very thing. And now I need to ask again. But take heart, dear Christians, because your Savior continues to receive you with loving, open arms, and the connection that he made with you at your baptism, it still holds strong. There he claimed you as his own. There he connected you with all that he did, how he lived, how he died, and how he also rose again to life. There is something special, too, about the way in which Jesus came into this world. And what I mean is that he was really born of a woman. He didn't become a butterfly to save the butterflies. He didn't become a fish to save the fish. He became a human being. The almighty, ever-present God, the one whose power knows no limits, the eternal God, was still able to contain himself fully in that infant child. What an awesome God we have that he would choose to come in this way, to live among us, that he would choose to make himself, in a sense, vulnerable. What an awesome God we have. That he would come in this way to assure us 
and to preach over and over again that we truly do have forgiveness in his name and in his blood. Yes, we have something to celebrate this afternoon, dear Christians. And not just today, but throughout the whole season, yes, throughout the rest of all of eternity. We have a Savior, dear Christians. And that Savior was born a human being, born of a woman, to adopt you into his family and to save you. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now confess our faith uh, in the following uh, hymn uh, sung to the tune, Hymn to Joy. Please be seated.
Please rise for prayer. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries, you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of their Savior. We praise you, O Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take to heart the words of John, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, spare us from the stress of deadliness and the frenzy of commercialism. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again, not as a lowly child, but as the Lord of Lords. Hear us now, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. And we pray the prayer that Christ has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May the Lord Jesus Christ, whose birth we are preparing to celebrate, and whose coming we are looking forward to, bless you and keep you this Christmas season. Amen. Amen. Please now be seated as we sing our closing hymn, Hymn 36.
Greetings again to you all and welcome in Christ's name. Uh, there, I just want to remind you that there is a meal after the service and you are certainly invited to attend that. Um, and it has been a pleasure to be here worshiping you with you here this afternoon. God bless you as you leave. <laughs> 